Are you looking for ways to strengthen your marriage? Would you like to raise children you enjoy being around? Do you long for a peaceful, orderly home that's a blessing to everyone who comes through its doors? Then you've come to the right place. I'm Jennifer Flanders, a Bible-believing, homeschooling mother to 12 and host of the Loving Life at Home podcast. Join me as we discover what God's Word has to say about marriage, motherhood, and minding the things that matter most. Hello, friend. Welcome to episode 59 of Loving Life at Home. Last week, we talked about the best wedding gift a couple will ever receive. If you missed it, I hope you'll go back and listen. I'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy to find. And the topic I want to talk about today is a gift very closely connected to that one that we discussed last week, and that is the gift of children. There was once a time when societies viewed children as God views them, as a rich blessing, a heritage, a gift, a reward. They were seen as an integral and valuable part of the family. Moreover, having babies was the natural progression after getting married, not a distant afterthought. A large family was considered an asset, not a liability. But times have changed. We live in a society today that views children as an inconvenient burden or an annoying obstacle to self-fulfillment. A society that worships autonomy and views self-absorption as a good and noble trait that passes out free abortions and vasectomies like candy, as was done at the Democratic National Convention last week. It is heartbreaking. By the year 2020, fertility rates in the U.S. had dropped to the lowest we've seen in over 40 years. Although the news reports heralding that bleak statistic often speak of our nation's fertility, what they're actually describing is our birth rate. The problem is not so much that we're unable to conceive, but that as a nation, we are choosing not to conceive and terminating a large percentage of the pregnancies that do occur. Consequently, for nearly every group of women of reproductive age, U.S. birth rates have plummeted. This sharp decline has resulted in the fewest newborns our country has seen since the late 1970s, just one short decade before my husband and I conceived the first of our 12 children. When we notice such trends, it's always smart to ask why. Why aren't people having more babies? Why aren't children loved and valued and protected in our country as they should be? In past generations, getting married, settling down, and raising a family were considered markers of a successful transition into adulthood, markers of the vast majority of young people achieved by the time they turned 30. This is no longer the case. These days, college-age kids rarely consider themselves ready for that kind of responsibility. They don't want to rush into anything they might later regret. In their minds, the risks far outweigh the benefits. And if they're unwilling to commit to marriage, which society now views as transient and disposable, how much less inclined are they to shoulder the lifelong attachment and responsibility of parenthood? Unfortunately, even couples who overcome their risk aversion sufficiently enough to tie the knot often pause at the prospect of starting their family. I've told you before, but my husband and I married when we were both still students. He was 20, I was 22. He was juggling three jobs and attending night school to finish his bachelor's degree. I was teaching calculus labs while working on my master's in math. All the while, we lived in a cheap apartment complex populated by topless dancers, suspected drug dealers, and impoverished neighbors who were under constant threat of eviction. The standard advice our parents and premarital counselors offered was to wait five years minimum before starting a family. First, we should get to know one another, finish our degrees, buy a house, or at least move to a safer, more child-friendly neighborhood. All well-meaning recommendations to be sure, but advice that, by the gracious providence of God, we immediately and happily ignored by getting pregnant two weeks into our honeymoon. More children followed in quick succession. Consequently, I spent the first 25 years of our marriage either pregnant or nursing or both. And now, 37 years, 12 children, and 22 grandchildren later, with more on the way, we feel supremely blessed. It saddens me to see married couples postponing children indefinitely or even willfully choosing to remain childless for life. So today, I'd like to challenge Christian couples especially to live counterculturally by rejecting the bias against having children that is presently in vogue. Somebody recently asked me whether I thought Christians have a moral duty to have children. 
I don't know that we can go that far. The call God has placed on your life will likely look different than mine and vice versa. As 1 Corinthians twelve fourteen reminds us, the body does not consist of one part, but many. But I can say with 100% confidence that Christians are morally obligated to live in agreement and in accordance with God's Word. As far as we are able, we should view everything we encounter in this world as God Himself views it. And Scripture makes it indisputably clear that God considers children a blessing. Psalms 127, 3 through 5 says, Behold, children are a gift or a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Then Psalm 128, 4 reads, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his way. When you eat the fruit of the labor of your hands, you will be happy and it will go well for you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, for so shall a man who fears the Lord be blessed. Genesis 1.28 tells us, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And then in Deuteronomy 7.13, He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb and the produce of your land. So it is our Christian duty to regard children the same way God regards them, as a blessing rather than a burden. And they are a blessing. Now, I'm not trying to convince anybody to have a house full of kids they don't want. Raising children is hard work. It's rewarding work to be sure, but it's also challenging. And if the only reason somebody undertakes that task is because I've convinced them that that's the thing to do, then that motivation will be insufficient to keep them going when the going gets tough. That's why my goal instead is threefold. First, I want to convince Christians to study what God says in His Word about the matter for themselves. As Jesus points out in John 8, 31, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. So I encourage you to study what God's Word says on this topic and make certain that you are viewing the prospect of having children the same way God views that prospect, and you're bringing your thoughts and opinions into line with what He says is right and true and desirable, instead of just parroting what the world says about marriage and motherhood and children. I know for a fact that the Holy Spirit can do a far better job of convicting and convincing you than any 20-minute podcast could ever hope to accomplish. Second, I want to encourage Christians to live a yielded life. What your yielded life looks like may and very likely will be different than what my yielded life looks like, but it should be our goal as believers to bring every facet of our existence under the Lordship of Christ, and that includes our thoughts and beliefs, the way we steward our time, our money, our work, our leisure activities, how we use and develop the gifts and talents with which we've been entrusted, and yes, even how we steward our fertility and family size. Our goal should be to glorify God as 1 Corinthians 10.31 commands us to do, and to walk by faith, not by sight, as we're told in 2 Corinthians 5.7, in each and every one of those areas. Then my third goal is to always be ready and willing to explain to those who ask me and my husband why we've made the choices we've made, just as the Bible instructs us to do. There we read, but in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you, but respond with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who slander you may be put to shame by your good behavior in Christ. That's 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16. This verse is the reason that I've written so many books and blog posts and recorded podcast episodes on this and related topics. I'll link a few of those in today's show notes in case you're interested in reading more. It's also why I try to give thoughtful responses to readers or listeners who follow up with even more questions. It's why I'm patient with strangers who notice our family size and ask probing questions, including questions that some folks might consider rude. And it explains why our family has agreed to do interviews with Al Jazeera, the BBC, 2020, and the like. We are more than happy to share the faith and the hope that has undergirded our family planning decisions and to explain how clearly and repeatedly God has confirmed to us that children are a huge blessing in far more ways than we originally imagined. So we tell them, as Christians, our goal is to love 
and serve God with everything we've got, with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, like it says in Luke 10, 27. For us, fertility is a natural extension of that concept. If we believe that God can be trusted with our health and our home and our finances and our eternal security, and we do, then why not trust Him with our family size too? By leaving the family planning to God, we merely acknowledge what the Bible has made clear from the beginning. It is God who opens and closes the womb. Okay, now with those three purposes in mind, a commitment to studying God's word, a desire to live a yielded life, and a willingness to gently and respectfully defend our faith, let's examine some of the reasons that modern day couples commonly give for actively avoiding parenthood. The reluctance some couples feel about having children may stem from a desire to maintain control. They want to make sure that the timing is perfect, land a high-paying job, buy a roomy house, pay off school loans, reach the point where they can provide everything that the world claims is necessary for the health, happiness, and well-being of their offspring. They want all their ducks in a row before they'll even consider trying for a baby. And until that day comes, they'll tell you, we can't afford children. They don't feel like they have enough money and or time to start their family. Which begs the question, how much money does it take to raise a child to adulthood? I've seen the headlines that estimate the cost to be anywhere from $237,000 to $1.1 million per child. It's no wonder such a price tag would scare away a lot of folks. Of course, I'm speaking from experience here. If you're willing to buy things secondhand and to forego dressing your children in designer clothes or sending them to Ivy League schools, and if you can turn a deaf ear to the steady stream of marketing ads trying to convince you to buy things you don't really need, then you can reduce that bottom line dramatically. David wrote in Psalm 3725, I was young and now I am old, and yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. That's so true. The Bible promises that God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, Philippians 419. And we do well to remember that fact and live like we believe it. That's not to say you won't need to moderate your lifestyle. You may not be able to maintain the same standard of living after children as you had before or to afford as large a house or as nice a car or as swanky a vacation. Several years ago, my husband had a partner who told him, you know, if you'd only stopped at two children, you could have afforded to retire early with money in the bank and a $2 million mansion like me. Now, that may not be a verbatim quote. I only heard it secondhand, but that was the unmistakably clear message. However, by God's grace, my husband and I both instinctively knew that all those material trappings would not and could not ever bring us the deep satisfaction shepherding a dozen living souls has provided. And I wouldn't trade the fruit of our choices for a world of big bank accounts or fancy houses. A few weeks ago, I saw an interview in which somebody asked Tucker Carlson, and what advice he'd give to young people these days. And without so much as a pause to deliberate, his answer was to get married and have children ASAP. He claimed it was the bravest and most creative thing a person could do. He also stressed the fact that money doesn't satisfy. I don't have the exact quote written down, but he elaborated by saying something along the lines of, I've known a lot of rich people in my life and they've all been miserable. So don't chase wealth. Invest in things that really matter to which I say a hearty amen. If some couples put off having children because of finances, others opt out because they're scared. They're afraid of making mistakes, afraid they'll fail, afraid they'll be bad parents, afraid they don't have what it takes. What do we know about raising children, they ask rhetorically, or even more common, they'll claim, I don't have enough patience. Well, good news. Raising children can be very maturing and sanctifying if you're willing to embrace that aspect of parenting and allow God to use the process to mold you into a better, I started to say a better version of yourself, but that's not exactly right. His goal instead is to conform us to the image of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that having a baby magically and immediately transforms you into a selfless saint, but God definitely can and does use your children to root things like stubborn pride and selfishness out of your heart and replace them with a humble concern for the needs of others and the soul-nourishing fruit of His Spirit. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, as is enumerated in Galatians 5.22. The verse I quoted a minute ago about God supplying all our needs, we need to remember that isn't just talking about physical needs like food and clothing, but about spiritual needs as well, like wisdom and understanding and endurance and patience. What's more, we can be confident that He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus, as we read in Philippians 1.6, and that includes the good work he started when he makes us parents. Another personal objection I sometimes hear from women who've had extremely difficult pregnancies and or hard deliveries, or their mothers had complications and they don't want to follow in the same footsteps, they dread pregnancy and childbirth. Maybe they don't relish the idea of puking up their guts for nine months solid. I've had friends who were still throwing up in the delivery room, or perhaps they're concerned that they literally won't survive giving birth. To be honest, I don't have an easy answer for that one. We live in a fallen world, and all these things need to be taken into prayerful consideration. As I've said before, I have easy pregnancies, smooth deliveries, healthy babies, stable emotions, physical strength, and a happy marriage. The list goes on and on, so it made perfect sense for me to keep having babies and lots of them, but not every woman is blessed with those same circumstances. Fortunately, God promises wisdom to those who ask, not just for day-to-day living, but for making tough decisions like the one described. James 1.5 tells us, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him, and to her too. So pray for wisdom and discernment, as you'll likely hear opposing viewpoints regardless of what you decide. So determine ahead of time you will proclaim with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 I've sometimes heard 1 Timothy 2.15 used as an argument for having babies despite health risks. It reads, women, however, will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. But does that really apply to this discussion? What does will be saved through childbearing even mean? Well, I don't believe it's talking about the eternal salvation of our souls. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 makes this clear. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as the result of works, so that no one may boast. And if we tried to interpret 1 Timothy 2, 15 to mean that women are saved by means of childbearing, we would be contradicting the clear teaching of Scripture that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. So maybe when it says women will be saved through childbearing, it means we will be preserved through childbirth. Indeed, that's how the most recent NASB version renders this verse. Yet, I know of many pious women who died while giving birth. In fact, before the advent of modern medicine, and especially antibiotics, one in five women died giving birth or shortly thereafter. So while that understanding may be generally true, it doesn't seem to capture the meaning of this passage completely. I've read some commentaries that suggest 1 Timothy 2.15 refers to Christ, who through childbirth became flesh to die for our sin. But while that is certainly how history played out, I think you really have to read between the lines to get that meaning out of this verse. After giving birth 12 times over and dedicating so much time to raising those dozen children to adulthood, I wonder if perhaps Paul was suggesting that childbearing could save women from a misspent life. Certainly, the responsibility of raising so many children prevented my engaging in much of the idle gossip Paul cautions against a couple of chapters later. In 1 Timothy 5, 13 through 14, he warns, at the same time, they will also learn to be idle, going from house to house and being not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies discussing things they should not mention. So I advise the younger widows to marry, have children, and manage their households, denying the adversary occasion for slander. Did you notice that last part? Paul provides an antidote for the idle, gossip-driven, busybody life that he just described, and his solution was to marry, have kids, and invest your energy in keeping your own household running smoothly. And I suspect his earlier comment on women's being saved Saved through childbirth may have been rooted in this same line of reasoning. Whew, I don't even know how I got off on that tangent, but there it is. In the meantime, let's get back to the common objections that couples give for postponing or avoiding children. My husband sent me an article a few weeks back 
about a French writer by the name of Corinne Meyer, who recently published a book called Me First. I won't bother linking that one in the show notes because it's definitely not a book I'd recommend. But in it, the author promotes selfishness as a virtue and warns women not to get married or to have children because, quote, motherhood is a trap, marriage is a bad deal. Of course, my husband suspected that headline would really get my dander up when he sent it to me, and he was right. Thankfully, I don't think that this particular title has been translated into English yet, but I did some digging and found out that this same author wrote another book back in 2007 that became an international bestseller. I think the English title of that one was No Kids, and in it, she presented what she considered 40 good reasons not to have children. Her list included things like, this is paragraph phrase, kids will ruin your sex life. (laughs) That one really made my husband and me both laugh out loud because it's so demonstrably untrue. You can bet I've had a lot more sex since becoming a mother than I ever did before. Or traveling with kids is a nightmare. A challenge, yes, but a nightmare? That hasn't been our experience either. We love traveling with our kids. It's so much more fun to explore new places and try new things when we get to enjoy it together as a family. Or kids will inevitably disappoint you. Well, if you're expecting your children to be perfect, then maybe this is true. But if you approach parenting with the understanding that every one of us, mom and dad included, have a sin nature that needs to be brought into subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ, then you won't be surprised or shocked or scandalized when your kids act in accordance with that fallen nature, but will view it as an opportunity to train them and lovingly point them to Jesus. Another reason the author gave for not having children is that kids are expensive. Now, I've already addressed that topic earlier. Earlier, and that kids will cause you to lose contact with all your friends, which is not necessarily true. But having kids also leads to the formation of lots of wonderful new friendships, both with the kids themselves and with their friends and with their friends' parents. One thing this author said that I do think is valid and deserves discussion is, is the idea that kids won't satisfy your deepest longings. I love all my children dearly, and I do get a sense of satisfaction from knowing and raising and spending time with them. But ultimately, the source of my satisfaction is Christ. It is rooted wholly and completely in Him and in doing what He has called me to do, which of course includes mothering. I don't think it's fair for parents to expect their children to satisfy all the longings of their heart. That's neither wise nor necessary. You can still have a close, mutually encouraging relationship with each and every one of your children without depending on them to meet your deepest emotional needs. So the fact that they can't bring complete satisfaction should not be a deterrent to having children since a prudent parent would never expect them to do so anyway. Then I think there's a whole class of common objections to bring in children into the world that I would call philosophical in nature. One such objection I've heard is that having babies is a distraction from the more important work of sharing the gospel. I did an entire podcast on that particular argument. I'll link it in the show notes rather than trying to rehash it here. Just look for episode 15, Is Having Babies a Waste of Time? But suffice it to say here that I strongly disagree with that idea. Other couples will cite as their reason for remaining childless the idea that the world is too wicked. Yet, shouldn't that be all the more reasons for Christians to have babies? God calls us to be salt and light in our communities. Light dispels darkness and salt acts as a natural preservative. It slows the process of spoiling. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said it this way, You are the salt of the earth, but if that salt loses its flavor, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by man. You are the light of the world. A city that is on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Matthew five thirteen through 15. Note that even during their captivity, God told the exiles who were carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon to build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters, multiply there, do not decrease. That was in Jeremiah 29, 4 through 6. Babylon was a wicked empire, yet God did not view that as a reason for his people to stop being fruitful and multiplying. And I think the same would be true for us in the dark world that we live in today. 
The same is true of Egypt. We know that God also greatly multiplied Israelites during the years that they were slaves to Pharaoh. So the Egyptians appointed taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and flourished so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. That was Exodus 1, 11 through 12. So if God's answer for his people in the pagan cultures of Egypt and Babylon was to get married and have lots of children and busy themselves teaching those children about him, when you sit in your house, when you walk along the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, as again, we read in Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, why do we think his counsel would be any different for Christians in our culture today? Another objection I often hear is that the world is overpopulated. Some couples are genuinely concerned about global warming and climate change. They don't want to be a drain on the environment and are trying to do everything they can to reduce their carbon footprint, even at the cost of never having children. I talked a little about those arguments with Abby Halberstadt on an episode of her podcast, Emma's for Mama. I'll try to link that one in the show notes too. But even at 8.1 billion, if we assign 500 square feet of living space a piece to every man, woman, and child, we could fit the entire world population into an area the size of the state of Montana. That's 500 square feet per person, not per family. Interestingly, my entire family, my husband, myself, and the 10 children that we had at the time lived in a 500 square foot bachelor barracks for four months during a stateside deployment that my husband served with the Army Medical Reserves back in 2006. So I know it is possible. We saw a great documentary several years ago called Demographic Winter that did a fabulous job of addressing these fallacies of overpopulation. I'll try to look that one up too and link it in today's show notes. Yet, lots of countries find themselves in big trouble economically because birth rates have dropped below replacement levels. That leaves them with an aging population and not enough young workers to support them. Declining birth rates have caused so many problems, in fact, that some countries, as I mentioned earlier, are now paying their citizens to procreate. Another common argument I've heard against starting a family is that the world has grown too dangerous to bring more children into it. Some couples can't imagine having children in a world filled with so much violence and suffering. They don't want their little ones to face the reality of global pandemics, death, destruction, political unrest, economic hardship, terrorism, and so on. Again, we need wisdom for navigating these issues. Luke 23:29 warns us, look, The days are coming when people will say, blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and breasts that never nursed. I think it's interesting to note that this verse assigns that pronouncement to people. People will say that barren wombs are blessed. It doesn't say God agrees with that sentiment. In fact, in addition to the clear instructions God gave his children who were living in captivity in Babylon and Egypt, the ones I just read, we also have Matthew 24, 6, where Jesus says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Over and over again, we are told not to worry about tomorrow, and that command should impact and inform every facet of our lives, including family size. You will never go wrong trusting God to decide. Rarely are decisions completely one-dimensional, though. Undoubtedly, lots of different considerations help shape how a couple approaches the question of when and whether to have children. One couple's decision to postpone or forego children may be rooted in more selfish reasons. They want to have fun, enjoy their freedom, mark a few things off their bucket list first, and they know intuitively that having kids will bring an abrupt end to the carefree, autonomous, indulgent life that they are presently living. Another couple may have already had some kids and aren't sure they can handle any more. They view children as something to enjoy in moderation. One or two is fine. Four or five is scary. Any more than that is certifiably insane or abysmally ignorant. I can't even begin to count the number of times some stranger has counted my kids and then asked me, don't you know what causes that? Yet all these ideas stand in stark contrast to the word of God, which tells us unequivocally that children are a blessing and a heritage from him. So why aren't believers having more babies? Why aren't Christian counselors encouraging couples to be fruitful and multiply? Why aren't churches proclaiming the message that children are a blessing from God and greatly to be desired? Since when do Christians let the world dictate how they think about anything? Christians should be far more concerned with what God says about a subject than what social media, the general populace, psychological experts, Hollywood elites, or political pundits think of it. 
And when it comes to the topic of children, we see that God's word is unashamedly pro-child. Fertility is portrayed as a gift and a blessing, which it is, not as something to be despised, squandered, and short-circuited. And that brings up another important point, which is the fact that the only reason the question of when and whether to have babies is even a discussion is that thanks to birth control and abortion, our society has almost completely divorced sex from fruitfulness. But God's design and intent is for the two to go together. Genesis 2, 24 through 25 says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And Malachi two fifteen tells us, Has not the Lord made them one, having a portion of the Spirit? And why one? Because he seeks a godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. That phrase in Genesis that says, the two shall be one flesh, is not only talking symbolically about the physical union of the sex act itself, but is also literally in the fruit it produces, half of his DNA and half of hers combined to create an entirely new person. Sex, as God designed it to be enjoyed by a husband and wife fully committed to one another and open to receiving the blessing of children, is a potent thing, as we discussed last week in episode 50. When any of those elements are missing, marriage, faithfulness, procreative potential, sex is stripped of some of its power and meaning, and what is left is a distorted shadow of what it was meant to be. Jesus told his disciples, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, Matthew 19, 4. And I want my heart to reflect that same love for little ones and openness to receive them. Plus, as a Christian, I believe God is sovereign. He opens and closes the womb, and he can be trusted to work all things together, even family size and spacing, for our good and his glory, Romans eight twenty eight. I could talk about all the myriad and unexpected blessings my husband and I have personally experienced after giving God full control of our family planning and joyfully accepting all the children he's seen fit to send us. I could cite scientific studies as well that indicate having children and lots of them is correlated to good health and longevity. I cited and linked several of those studies in episode eight on smart reasons for having babies. I'll link that in the show notes today too. But personal anecdotes, logical arguments, scientific studies, and demographic Demographic downturns are insufficient in and of themselves to provide the grace needed to persist when the going gets tough. Parenting, again, is hard work. Couples need more than intellectual or economic arguments for having kids. They need a strong conviction, an abiding sense of purpose, a spiritual calling. They need a deep understanding that the Word of God is perfect and unchanging. A commitment to adopting and maintaining a scriptural view towards children is a refusal to exchange the marvelous natural function of our fertility for something unnatural, artificial, and purposefully designed to thwart God's intended plan. Becoming a parent, whether by birth or adoption, is an exercise in faith. Raising children is a way of glorifying God with the gifts He has given us, of serving Him through serving others, and of making disciples for Christ. For me and my husband, trusting God to determine the size of our family has been both a leap of faith and an act of worship as we've joyfully cooperated with his marvelous design. It has meant taking his yoke upon us, but finding it easy and light and filled with more joy than we ever could have imagined. That has been our experience, and I hope it will be yours as well. Thanks so much for listening today. If you have a question you'd like to hear covered on this podcast, message me on Instagram at Flanders underscore family or contact me through my website, lovinglifeathome.com. Before you go, if you've been encouraged by something you've heard on the show, do me a favor and forward the link to a friend or head over to Loving Life at Home on Apple iTunes to subscribe and leave a written review of the show. Your doing so will help others find me so they can listen too. Until next time, I pray the Lord will bless your efforts to build a loving home life centered on Him.